Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Katie Rowley. I'm with the NOAA Central Library, and we are happy to have Christina Hopkins here from Science Direct, who is going to be talking about um, optimizing your access to digital resources. I know everyone is on telework, and the library is um, trying really hard to get you those resources that you need. Um, this webinar will be recorded. If you have any questions, please place them in the question panel, and we will get to those um, at the end of the presentation. If we don't get to your question, it will be answered offline via email. And if you do have any issues with your audio or vis um, the visual component of the presentation, please try logging out and logging back in. And if you're still having issues, you can chat me or you can email library.brownbag at noaa.gov and I will try and help you troubleshoot that. Um, I'm also here to kind of clarify any questions you may have about uh, ScienceDirect and how your access through NOAA works, uh, along with Christina. And with that, Christina, I'm going to let you take it away. Great. Thanks, Katie. So hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this training on optimizing your access to digital resources on ScienceDirect. So like Katie said, my name is Christina and I work for Elsevier as a customer consultant where my main job is really to provide educational outreach for research institutions and universities across the US and Canada. Um, so this is definitely not my first go around. Um, I do come from a previous role conducting research in science education. So I do love that I still get the opportunity to teach. And the NOAA Central Library really has been vital in creating this digital webinar for all of the NOAA researchers. So thank you for being here. Thanks for attending. Um, so I wanted to first start by briefly discussing the current Elsevier efforts regarding coronavirus. I know we're all um, in a remote working environment that may be new to some of us. So what I wanted to do is kind of update you on what we're doing on our side as a publisher. So. While you may or may not be conducting research directly on the coronavirus, I do think it's valuable to point out the resources that we have made freely available to all of our patrons around the world. So Elsevier has created a coronavirus directory, which is probably the most important resource listed on this slide. Um, the directory is great because it has all of Elsevier's resources listed in one place, and they're really nicely categorized by audience, so you can look at it from a researcher perspective, a healthcare perspective, a student perspective, or what whatever caters your need. So a few things that I would like to make you aware of that are on this directory are the Information Center, which houses medical research on the coronavirus, as well as something called the Author Resilience Center. So this is a little bit newer to the directory. Uh, originally, we were really focused on getting research out there about coronavirus, right? trying to find uh, some kind of medical assistance or cure for this whole pandemic. Uh, but the Author Re Resilience Center is designed to provide resources for authors during this global pandemic or researchers. Uh, such as you at NOAA, right, are not working in your normal setting. So all of these websites are hyperlinked in this presentation. So when the webinar is over, I will share the slides with Katie and the, and the NOAA Central Library, and they can distribute these links to you. Or you can simply conduct a Google search, and you can find this web page online. So in terms of the agenda for today's session, uh, we're going to cover three kind of broad topics. So the first, uh, where does Science Direct as a platform fit into your research or workflow? Second, what is the Science Direct platform and what content does it have? And then third, using Science Direct, including conducting searches, the benefits of creating a Science Direct login, and key features on the platform. And if you hear any barking, it's because I have two dogs. <laughs> they bark at a lot of stuff. Um, so the researcher workflow, where does Science Direct really kind of fit into all of this, right? So 75% of researcher sessions start on some sort of search platform, such as Google Scholar or a discovery service. However, NOAA does not currently have a discovery layer that's really suited to peer reviewed literature, right? So a lot of you are probably using something like Google Scholar. Everyone has access to Google Scholar. It isn't necessarily optimized for peer reviewed literature searching. 
So why use a discovery system and not just Google it, right? This is a really common question I get, particularly from undergraduate students starting to get into research. Uh, discovery systems are designed specifically to support search and result handling for scholarly literature. So many discovery systems only index peer-reviewed literature, uh, and we know exactly what is covered in those discovery systems through entitlement lists. Uh, another really big thing that has come up in um, in recent years is the idea of fraudulent publication. So uh, right now there's over 10,000 fraudulent journals that do exist in the publishing landscape. Um, it is unfortunate that uh, so with the rise of technology, so comes um, fraudulent activity. Um, we do see that in the form of plagiarism. Um, so the other thing is that um, there is consistency and transparency when you're searching on a discovery system. So they have very basic algorithms that uh, really provide every search result um, in the same way for every user. So every result can be explained by the search you did and what was in the content. So something like Google Scholar, um, they do something really clever where they tend to drop some of your search terms to avoid giving too few results. And they also personalize your search results based on your behavior. So you and I could get very different results when we're actually conducting the same exact search with the same parameters. So if NOAA does not have a discovery layer and Google Scholar is not great, right? what options do you have? So at NOAA, you do have a few different options for discovering literature that you need for your work. Um, the first is going to the NOAA Central Library website, so library.noaa.gov. Um, from here, you can use a tool called the Journal Finder tool to search for journal title, titles that are field specific. Uh, you can also filter these journal title lists by publisher and what NOAA is entitled to. Um, the NOAA Central Library also has a catalog for searching physical resources should you need them. Um, the second option is you can go to Google Scholar. Now, this may sound like I'm contradicting myself, but what I really want to say is that Google may uncover certain resources that other platforms do not, and this is not necessarily a bad thing, but you should be consciously analyzing the source for its validity to make sure that you're looking at real work, right, not fraudulent work. And then the third option is to use a publisher specific platform like ScienceDirect. So I'll get more into exactly what the platform is a little bit later, uh, but a few benefits of using ScienceDirect is that it is a free access platform with optimized search algorithms for peer reviewed literature. Um, the negative side of using ScienceDirect is that it houses content from only one publisher, which would be Elsevier. So it should not be your only source for searching, but I would advise that if you have the time, searching on publisher sites is a great option for research at NOAA. So what is ScienceDirect and what content does it have? So ScienceDirect is the largest scientific journal and book platform that contains about a quarter of the world's scientific research. Currently, ScienceDirect contains over 16 million peer-reviewed publications from 3,800 journals and serials. We currently offer 250,000 open access articles and 270 fully gold open access journals. And we continue to add content to the platform every year at a rate of about 350 to 500,000 articles published. So Science Direct content spans four broad subject areas, including physical sciences, life sciences, health sciences, and social sciences. These subject areas can be further categorized into 24 specific content domains. You can see here uh, more specifically looking at environmental science, agricultural and biological science. Uh, those are particularly useful for an organization like NOAA. So these 24 domains can be further classified into subdomains, uh, but really this classification system is important because you can refine publications on ScienceDirect to look at specific domains or subdomains. So if you're looking for new journals, new books or book series in a particular subject area, um, you can do this on ScienceDirect in a tool called Browse Journals and Books, which I will show you a little bit later. So Science Direct and Open Access. Um, Elsevier is a leading open access publisher and we support both gold and green open access models. 
all gold open access articles are free for everyone to read and we can provide gold open access services because of uh, APCs that authors, their institutions or their funding bodies pay, uh, which covers all the expenses needed to support the publication process. So currently we have 270 journals which are fully gold open access uh, and the majority of our other journals are considered hybrid journals. So these journals support open access and they're kind of two journals in one. So it's both a subscription journal and an open access journal. Um, after acceptance, authors can choose how they wish to publish and broadcast their research. And green open access means that a version of the subscription article is free for everyone to access. And then this full subscription article uh, will be available for open access after an embargo period. Um, that is set by each journal. So they all have different embargo period timelines. So what are the different access levels uh, for journals and books? Um, ScienceDirect uses several different icons to indicate a document's access level. Um, access may also be determined specifically at the publication level. Um, so this would be where open access comes back into play. Um, for subscribed content, you are required to have an institutional account, which I will talk about a little bit later as well. Um, and then uh, these account level, uh, these access levels are specified on journal, volume, book, and article chapter level according to NOAA's subscription base. So here you see a chart that represents the icons on ScienceDirect that indicate a document's access level. Um, so you can see a very gr a green open, a green closed bubble, excuse me, uh, represents open access. So anyone can read and download the full content. Uh, we do have open archive as well. So these are green open access articles made available after the embargo period and that are also available for anyone to read and download. And then based on NOAA's entitlements, you'll see full text access as well. So this is based on NOAA's institution subscription to Science Direct, where you as a NOAA patron can read and download the full content. In terms of no access, we see this in two kind of versions. One, abstract only. So the full article or chapter is not part of your subscription, but you can read the abstract. Uh, and then you also will see no access where a separate, a separate abstract is not currently available. So the access type filters um, look like this on ScienceDirect. You can see that the full text and open access have the same green circle icon, um, but the abstract only has an empty circle icon. Um, I get asked quite frequently if you can filter ScienceDirect search results based on subscription access. And the short answer to this is not currently. Uh, this was a really popular feature that they had. Um, and then in October of 2018, they did take this feature away. Um, however, many researchers started to complain that they wanted to see subscription level access and content that they had um, specific access to through their institution. So we are beta testing, adding this feature back into ScienceDirect. So ScienceDirect journal entitlements in NOAA. So ScienceDirect currently publishes in about 2,500 active journals every year. We've already discussed um, the fully gold open access journals and journals with open archives, so you have those numbers. Um, but I want to briefly touch on entitlements. So NOAA is a really interesting case in that it's very widespread and that each NOAA site has access to different journals. So um, if you're not sure what you have access to, I would suggest that you consult with your librarian for a current list of entitlements if you would like it. Otherwise, these entitlements will be automatically honored on ScienceDirect based on your remote IP authentication system. If you need content but you currently do not have access, you have a couple of options. You can either use interlibrary loan through your librarian, you can purchase the content on your own or through the library if ILL is not available, or you could check out repositories that have available preprints that you can use. So getting into using ScienceDirect, we'll start with searching. ScienceDirect offers researchers two different search techniques. There's a quick search and there's an advanced search. 
So currently, um, I do want to point out, you cannot conduct image searches on ScienceDirect. This was a feature they had that they did take away. I know on Google, um, that is one main difference is that you can search with images on Google. Um, so that is one big difference. But we have the quick search option or the advanced search option. So going into the quick search, um, there's a couple of different locations where you can find the quick search bar on ScienceDirect. So we can find the quick search bar at the top of the ScienceDirect homepage, at the top of the search results page, on every article page, and on every journal and book table of contents. In the first three locations that are listed here, you will also find an option to conduct an advanced search, as you can see um, either to the right or to the bottom of the search bar. Uh, when you are searching, um, with the magnifying glass, you see where it says journal and book, table of contents, that is only a keyword search. So a little bit, uh, going a little bit deeper into quick search, when you type in um, a search at the, at the top of the page, so here we see uh, in the quick search bar, keyword search stem cell, right? Um, this is a really popular technique for quick searching. It is just typing in the search parameters and then filtering down to content based on different criteria. So you can see the filtering column on the left here. Uh, I often call this filtering col column your Amazon shopping column because you are, use the refine feature the same way as when you might be shopping online on a platform like Amazon. So for example, you want to buy shoes, but you need women's shoes that are a size eight that are black and made of leather, right? So you have a lot of options to filter down your search results. So on ScienceDirect, you can filter by year, by article type, by publication type, and by access type. So you can also sort your results based on relevance or by publication date. So you see in the upper right-hand corner, um, they're sorted by relevance or date. And the default on ScienceDirect is to sort by relevance. So what does sorting by relevance on ScienceDirect mean? Um, relevance is a particularly subjective word. Um, on ScienceDirect, we use search engine relevance algorithms. So search engine relevance is an algorithmic calculation that tells us how well text within a document return as a search result reflects the terms and criteria executed in a search query. So each document in the return result list is given a score based on a variety of different factors uh, dependent on the search parameters that you've entered in the search bar. So factors include a number of hits on a keyword that you've put in, how significant a word is, the proximity of search words, uh, the word position in a document, and the completeness. So does it contain all of your search parameters? So I have a lot more detail on search engine algorithms. If you really want to, uh, to know about it, I'm happy to send you that information. So in terms of the ScienceDirect quick search bar, there are many search fields that you can choose from. Uh, when you enter search terms in multiple boxes, so you have multiple fields that you're searching in, and an A and D, so an and connector is included in your search. So for example, we can search for stem and cell, right? If you want to search for a phrase, so if you're searching specifically for stem cell, uh, you want to use quotation marks to search for phrases. So when you're doing a keyword search, um, it's the broadest type of search because it searches in all fields of a document, excluding the references. So make sure uh, when you're using keywords and keyword searching, you use the singular form of a word, does not pick up plural, uh, searches for both. Um, and you don't want to use any kind of wildcard characters or stop words. So wildcard characters include asterisks or question marks, and they really should only be used in advanced searching. Uh, and stop words I will define in just a few slides. So a couple of other parameters, um, you can also search by author name, which finds names and initials for all authors on a publication. So searching for John Smith could find both Randy Smith and John Holmes because you're searching for John and Smith, right? The and connector tied your two terms together. To search for just John Smith, uh, you're gonna wanna use curly brackets or quotation marks. A searching by journal or book title will return either a list of journals and books to browse or a search results list of articles if you have entered more than one search parameter.
So you can also search by volume and by page number, which I'm not going to go into, go into a lot of detail here. Um, but the most specific form of quick search would be to use multiple search boxes in your search as your results would be limited to articles which contain all of your search terms. So I want to point out a couple of tips for searching with special characters. So Science Direct automatically searches both British English and American English spellings. So in a, in a few cases, you might use a wildcard um, or a truncation search um, to accommodate the variation in British and American English spellings. You don't need to do that on Science Direct. Um, and then when you're searching for Greek letters, Science Direct will match the spelling of the letter as well as both the uppercase and lowercase version. So if you're searching for omega, um, you can type in the word omega spelled out and it will search for that word as well as the uppercase omega and the lowercase omega. Subscript and superscripts are also often ignored and you can write uh, that text on the same line so you don't have to be worried about trying to uh, subscript or superscript characters. And then as well, uh, both accented characters and non-alphanumeric -alpha characters are ignored in science direct searching. So here's a list of stop words that are not searchable on Science Direct unless they are enclosed in quotation marks or curly brackets. So you can see that these are kind of generic words, right? So we see again, almost, because especially these are not necessarily words that are going to help you find exactly what you're looking for when you're doing a search on Science Direct. So they are often removed unless you use quotations or curly brackets. So moving on to advanced searching on ScienceDirect. On ScienceDirect, you also have the option to conduct an advanced search by simply clicking on the advanced tab on the quick search bar. So when you click on this tab, uh, you will see a list of multiple fields that you can fill out. But more importantly, you can use the keyword search box to combine terms using up to eight Boolean operators at once. So you can use parentheses um, to group terms together, such as searching for the phrase black hole or radiation and gravity, right? So we can start to make our keyword searching a little bit more complex. Um, advanced search also allows uh, the possibility to exclude terms by using something called the minus hyphen operator. So for example, to find articles related to depression, but not economic depression, you can type in depression and then the minus symbol economics. Uh, these minus operators also work for author names as well, where you could search for an author name like Heisenberg, but not Sommerfeld using this minus operator. So because the advanced search form is intentionally very open in its design and it allows for specifying multiple pieces of information, you can easily build a very customized search. Uh, so none of the available fields are mandatory when you create an advanced search query. Uh, you only have to complete one field with searchable information. So search fields available on advanced search include keywords, journal or book title, years, authors, author affiliation, um, you can search just by title, abstract, or keywords, as well as by only the title, uh, the volume, issue, or page number, uh, the DOI, ISBN, ISSN, uh, just in the references, or just by article types. So you have a lot of options. So wildcard characters can be used only in advanced searching. Um, there's two wildcard options, uh, the asterisk and the question mark. Uh, the asterisk can be used to represent any number of characters. Uh, this wildcard is most often used at the end of a root word. So for example, if you are searching for variations of the word education, um, so you would type in uh, educat with a star or an asterisk, and that would give you results that include educate, educated, education, educational, or educator. A question mark wildcard can be used to represent a single character anywhere in the word. So I find this one very specific to scientific searching. Um, so for example, when you're searching for question mark immunoglobulin, uh, you would return all five forms of immunoglobulin in your search results.
So we've talked a little bit about where ScienceDirect can fit into your workflow and how to conduct searches. Uh, on ScienceDirect, you can also create a personalized Elsevier account that works across all of our products. But what are the benefits of creating this user login, right? Because it's not mandatory. So first, let's talk about how do you logistically create a user account. So when you're on ScienceDirect, the upper right-hand corner will show a create an account or sign in option. Uh, creating an account is similar to creating an account on any website, right? Uh, you have first name, last name, email, password. Uh, but one thing that I want to explicitly point out here is that in order for your personal account to have remote access to NOAA entitlements, you have to create this Elsevier account while you are connected to the IP authentication system that NOAA uses. So if you are not connected through the IP, uh, our internal Elsevier system will not know that you are affiliated with NOAA and your personal Elsevier account will only include free access content. So if you already have an account on, on ScienceDirect and it is not connected to NOAA, then you can contact our ScienceDirect help desk and they will help get your account connected properly to NOAA's entitlements. So there are two main benefits to logging into ScienceDirect when you're using the platform, and those are in the form of alerts and recommendations. So starting with alerts, you can set up search alerts to notify you of new volume issues of specific journals, book series, and handbooks added on ScienceDirect. ScienceDirect will send you an alert when new content is published that matches your request. And you can manage your alert on your profile page under the My Alerts tab. Alerts are different from recommendations, which are based on relevance and not publication date. So when you set up an alert, you're only looking at new content that's coming into the ScienceDirect platform. So there are two ways to set up an alert. Um, when you search or browse for a publication that you want to receive alerts for, you can simply click on the journal to open up the journal page and set up and select set up journal alerts. When you click this option, you will set up if you want an alert for the table of contents or the articles in press, and then you click save. So you can also set up a search alert by, or excuse me, a journal alert by going to your username, by clicking on manage alerts, and then at the bottom of the page, um, you click on find a publication to add. So from there, you can browse any publication you want, go to the publication homepage, and then create the alert. To set up an alert for a search query, uh, you can run the search on ScienceDirect, and then you click set search alert on the search results page, which shows up just above that Amazon column that I was talking about. So when you go to save the search alert, you can alter how often ScienceDirect will email you with alerts. Um, and this process is the same for both quick searching and advanced searching. So if you have not received alerts that you create on ScienceDirect, be sure to check your spam, junk, or quarantine mail folder. Uh, you may need to verify that the ScienceDirect notifications email address uh, is a secure sender, um, and this will usually fix the issue. Uh, if you have recently changed your email address associated with your account, uh, the alert may have gone to your previous email address, but it usually fix, fixes itself before the next um, iteration of alert emails. Uh, the alert could also have been deleted or the alert frequency changed, so the owner of the alert is the only one to delete or modify the alert. Um, however, you can make alerts and send it to someone else's email address. So someone could create an alert for you and send it to you, right? Um, so you wanna make sure that your email is the one that uh, is receiving the alerts that you would like to receive. So ScienceDirect recommendations. So recommendations sends registered signed in visitors weekly lists of recommended research content based on your previous search history and your signed in activity. Recommendations are typically delivered via email, although they are also listed on ScienceDirect. Um, you must have logged in and accessed at least two articles in the last 60 days for recommendations to automatically be sent to your inbox. 
So when you register for an account on ScienceDirect, you are automatically opted into this feature uh, to receive recommendation emails. However, you are not under any obligation to use this feature. So you can unsubscribe via email at any time to the recommendations, or you can turn off this feature on your ScienceDirect profile directly on the platform. So there are four key features of ScienceDirect that I wanna to touch base on before we wrap up the PowerPoint. The first key feature is called ScienceDirect Topic Pages. So Topic Pages is relatively new to ScienceDirect. It came out about two years ago, uh, but Topic Pages are a free layer that basically provide a sort of Wikipedia page for different research topics that is based on book content that is published on ScienceDirect. So each topic page includes the topic itself, a short definition of the topic, any related terms, and excerpts from relevant book content. So topic pages are available for PDF download and offline reading. And our journal articles are linked to these topic pages. So when you are reading an article and perhaps you come across a word that you don't know, it's typically coded in um, blue, you can click on that word and then link out to the topic page. The second key feature is the browse journals and book homepages. So when you are browsing journals and books on ScienceDirect, this is the only place where you can filter based on subscription or complementary access. Like I said, that we are doing beta testing to include this in search results, so that will come hopefully in the near future. But currently, this is the only place where you can filter based on this type of access. Um, but this feature really allows you to just easily look through journals and books in different subject domains and then go directly to the journal or book homepage. So, for example, when you click on a journal homepage, you will get access to a ton of information about the journal. So not only can you browse the latest issues as well as archived publications for that journal, but you can also set up journal alerts. Um, and you can learn more about the journal itself. So each journal homepage includes a link to submit an article for publication, as well as a link to the guide for authors outlining requirements for publication submissions. So the third key feature I wanna point out is actually on Elsevier.com and not on ScienceDirect, although they are linked. So when you click on about the journal, when you're looking at a journal homepage, you will actually link out to the Elsevier journal page where you can look at journal insights, um, which really gives you information about uh, metrics. So it shows you recent site score metrics and you can actually click into that and see how they've been trending over the last few years. You can also look at other, rank, uh, other journal metrics that do take into account subject area uh, and weighted citation impact. Um, so all of the metrics are listed there for you to see. Um, and just as a, a side note, site score, although less popular, is the Elsevier equivalent to impact factor. So every journal on ScienceDirect does have a site score. So the fourth key feature I want to highlight is our in-text linking. So um, Elsevier references are connected to one another within ScienceDirect, and you can trace these references back in time. So any reference that's highlighted in blue represents an in-text link to that reference. So when you click on it, that new source will open up. So the last key feature that I wanna show you is the export citations tool. So ScienceDirect allows users to export citations to create bibliographies using different citation management programs. So the most popular program, uh, the most popular programs include Mendeley, RefWorks, and EndNote, which you export in a RIS format. Um, so when a user exports a citation, they download a file to their local computer, and from there you import that file directly into the citation manager that you have downloaded on your computer. There are multiple locations from which you can export citations, including from the article page, from a journal article list, from a book table of contents, or from search results. 
So the maximum number of citations you can export at once is 100, uh, and you must select at least one article for export. Um, if one or more articles are selected, Science Direct will show you how many articles you've selected for export and then give you the option of how you would like to export them. Christina, I want to say that everyone at NOAA has access to EndNote. We okay. have a NOAA wide license, so uh, if you go to the library's website, you can find the uh, product information and download information for EndNote. Oh, great. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so last thing, um, how can I export my citations? Um, I've already referenced uh, the different locations where you can conduct citation exports. So I do have some instructions here for you depending on where you're at in your, um, your research workflow. So I'm not gonna go all over all of this in detail, but I have included these directions um, for your reference. So are there any questions so far about anything I've covered about the platform? Uh, so far, not too many. I've been able to answer most of them because they're pretty NOAA specific. Um, but if you were going to export citations uh, for a particular author, would you kind of just do a general search for that author? Yeah, so what I would do is I would search um, do an advanced search and try to write the author's name as specifically as possible and then export from there directly from the search results list. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, another option you do have that's not specifically on ScienceDirect um, is that Mendeley has, has really changed. Uh, I know this is not a Mendeley training, <laughs> but they have really changed the way they approach citation management. So they actually have author pages now it looks a little bit like linkedin um, but there's an author page that you can connect your orchid right and have all your publications listed um so you can go there as well right so the downside of using science direct for that type of search is that if there are repetitions in names right if you're searching for someone like even my name christina hopkins is extremely common um you're going to get all publications with researchers who have that name right versus a very specific author so i would suggest actually in that case probably going to something like mendeley where you can manage your own publication list uh, but you can't it is possible yes to do it on science direct great thank you we did have one more question uh can you see as a as a searcher um how many times an articles an author's article has been downloaded how many times? Um, that's a good question. How many? I'm just writing it down. Um, when we go into the demo, we can actually look and see if that information is on Science Direct. I know it's on Scopus. <laughs> Cover a lot of products. Um, I'll have to double check with Science Direct. Great, I think we're good to move into the demo. Perfect. Um, so there was just um, one other thing I wanted to briefly cover um, as a little bit of a sidebar. Um, so I wanted to point out, I know we have the Author Resilience Center through coronavirus, and we also have a free e-learning platform called Researcher Academy. So uh, this platform provides learning modules and resources centered on the research and publishing cycle. So topics covered include applying for funding, writing research, research data management, the fundamentals of publishing, ethics and publishing, dealing with peer review and research communication. So uh, we've gotten a lot of positive feedback about this, this platform. So please check it out if you have questions or anything about the publisher cycle. Uh, this is a great feature. And then you can see um, the email, uh, the website address at the bottom, researcheracademy.elsevier.com. And then kind of one other little plug is to stay tuned for a virtual publisher workshop where the NOAA Central Library and Katie will be hosting a publisher from the Marine Policy Journal to discuss tips and tricks on how to get published. So this is coming up in June. Uh, so be sure to um, stay tuned for notification on that session. And then the last thing is I do want to leave you with my email address. If any of you have questions, that 
you want to directly ask me about the platform, um, then feel free to reach out. So great. So now I will go into the demo. So we will change to show screen two. Okay. So here we see this is sciencedirect.com, right? Um, so when you're on ScienceDirect, if you are logged in, your name will appear here. Um, the little icon with the, it looks like a little house, right? Um, this actually shows your institutional connection. So I'm working um, out of an Elsevier account. So it will say brought to you by, and then in your case, it will say Noah. Um, so when you are looking at your profile, this is where you can find uh, your recommendations and your alerts, right? So if I click on something like my recommendations and I go to this page, um, I get a full list of personalized recommendations based on my recent signed in activity. So you can always ask, access them on the website directly. Uh, you can also set your preferences here. So under preferences, this would be where you can toggle on or off whether you want recommendations to be sent to your email address. There's also the tab for alerts. So I don't currently have alerts set, but I could find a publication that I would like. Um, I can also set a search alert. So you'll see both of these here. Um, and then one other thing that I actually wanna point out, this is a very, very new feature. Um, it's called history. So if it loads, in the case that it is normally functioning, there we go. Um, your recent activity on ScienceDirect. This shows all of your recent activity. So how have you been interacting with the profile? Um, what content have you been looking at? So um, anytime you're anywhere in ScienceDirect, there's kind of two ways to essentially reset yourself. Um, the first is that you can actually click on the ScienceDirect logo and this will bring you back to the homepage. Or you can just start searching. So you have the search icon here. When it says search ScienceDirect, you are doing a keyword search, so keep that in mind. Um, so if I'm gonna do a keyword search here, I could type in marine policy, right? And I click enter. So here we've done a keyword search for marine policy. I did not use quotations. So I just wanna point out that uh, my search results are marine and policy, right? So in some cases we are gonna see marine policy come up specifically. Uh, we see the journal listed up here because that happens to be the title of a journal. Um, but then we also see certain article names that include marine and policy, not necessarily right next to each other. So in this corner here, we see the sorted by relevance and date. Um, date is taken into consideration when you sort by relevance, so it's not going to put necessarily the oldest content at the top, right? It is going to put recent content as well, um, but just explicitly ex uh, sort by date. You can always switch this over. And then on the left here, you see how many results you got, right? So this is a great example of a very, very broad search. Um, that's not necessarily effective for finding literature, right? I don't have the time to go through 63,482 results. Um, so what I can do is um, I can search or I can refine by any of the parameters that we've discussed. So we see year, um, article type, publication title, and access type. So if you are wanting to search, uh, to refine by more than just the article types listed, you actually get quite a few options. <laughs> um, so in a, in a field like engineering, for example, conference papers become extremely significant in their publication process, uh, in their research workflow, so you can sort there. Uh, and then you can also sort by publication title. And then here you see a set search alert, um, where when I click on set search alert, I can name it, and then this is actually the only type of alert on ScienceDirect where you can change the frequency. So if you're setting a search alert for a journal or a book series, uh, it's the frequency is as published. So every quarter or every month or however often they publish, that's when you get a notification. When you do a search alert, you change your, your frequency. So you can either get a notification weekly or monthly. So 
In terms of access options, uh, we can see here the access is usually listed right next to the article type. So here we see short communication, uh, which is the article type, and then full text access. You do have the option to either download selected articles or export citations. So when we're selecting on a variety of articles that you want to export, when you click download, you will download a zip file for content only that you have access to. So if all of these say abstract only, then there's no download option, right? There's no PDF there for you to download. Um, when you're exporting, when I click export, we see three citations have been selected. How would you like to export them? For EndNote, we would export in a RIS format. So we talked about how you know 63,000 results is quite a bit. If you're wanting to refine this in any way, you can always drop down your current search uh, into an advanced search where this is only even the first half of the field. So you have all of these fields available for you to, to conduct your search as well. Um, if you need help writing very complicated search queries, right? Um, there is a search tips section on our help desk. When you click this, it will, it will help you to actually write more sophisticated and more complicated search queries. So, and then last thing, um, this refined by subscribe journals, it is in beta testing. Um, I'm actually very excited to see this come back. I think it's a great feature of Science Direct. You should be able to refine based on what you're subscribed to. Um, so be on the lookout for that. It probably won't show up on your current platform um, because I have an internal account, but we should be seeing that um, for customers very soon. So if I go to click on an article, let's see. Um, I click on here's a review article where I have full text access um, you have a couple of options um, in terms of viewing so you can either read the article right on the web page right which is just re requires you to scroll down um, you have the table of contents here on the left um, and then um, if you click download PDF it will actually open up something called the enhanced reader which um, looks like this so it's essentially a nice looking PDF version of the document. Um, you can either read it right on here, right? Or you can download, which was your original intent. So all you do is click the, the down arrow and then that will be downloaded in a PDF uh, directly to uh, your hard drive. So let's see, um, other information that's listed, uh, you have the author information. In some cases, they do have an account with us and they have put their email for reference, so you can actually email them about their article if you need to. Um, you also see the DOI, uh, as well as figures and tables on the left. Oh, and then um, to answer your question about downloads, it does not look like we currently list how many downloads that article has had on ScienceDirect, but we do include something called PlumX. So PlumX was not something that I spoke about originally, but we do have um, article level metrics available um, for every article. So in, if there is PlumX metrics, this is a very new article, so this is hard to say, uh, but it, in certain PlumX metrics, it does include captures, which would reference downloads of that article. So you actually have to click on PlumX, click on View Details, and then you would be able to see that information if it exists. Now this article was published last month, so uh, not a lot of traction yet, but you know, to, to come soon, I'm sure. So Christina, we do have a question. Um, if ScienceDirect allows uh, for cited reference searches to determine what subsequent articles have cited a given publication. I see. So how many articles, if this article has been cited X amount of times, do you get like a, a search result for that? Is that I'm not saying? sure um, a search result, but I do see that off to the side on the right above article metrics is citing articles. So mm -hmm. I believe that would give you a list, correct? If, if there it was would give a you a list. Um, yeah. So um, I'm not sure that, that list is 
you know, very expansive. I think it depends on how many citing articles there are. So in some cases, you know, articles have thousands of uh, citations, right? Um, so I don't think all of them would be listed, but it would it include at least a few, yes. Great. Um, um, another thing you could do for that is when you're searching, um, you could do an advanced search where you're searching directly in the references and then look for that author name. Um, that would be kind of another way to go about it, a little more convoluted. Gotcha. Okay. Um, with your authors, we have a question if you are affiliated at all with uh, ResearchGate. Um, not at this time. We do not connect with ResearchGate. Um, I'm not sure if that will be something that happens in the future, but no, uh, right now I think the only organizations that we connect with are ORCID, um, pretty explicitly with ORCID, especially on a platform like Scopus, um, and then Mendeley as well. Great, thanks. Uh, we do have one more question. Um, sure. How do you create a topic page from the article view? So, yes, you beat me to the punch. Um, <laughs> so, okay, when you're looking at an article, um, this is a very new article, right? I've, I've said that before, uh, published last month. Really new articles typically are not gonna have topic page connections just yet. Uh, it takes a little bit of time for them to mine that, that the data within an article. Uh, but if we look at something that's a little bit older, here's an article uh, in Marine Policy from February of 2019. So when you're looking at an article, you see uh, words written in blue, right? So this is actually a topic page. So we see renewable energy um, here. We see feed-in tariffs, right? There's like over 400,000 topics, so they're pretty expansive. Uh, but here, that's how we get to the topic page. So we're not actually creating topic pages, right? It's more like we're, we're, we're looking for them. Um, when you're in an article, any term that you see that is colored in blue, um, has a topic page. So feed-in tariffs would also have a topic page. Um, the other way to get to topic pages is to actually just go to the index. So it's sciencedirect.com slash topics slash index, and then you can search for a topic um, within the whole list. So one thing I like about topics is that terms are separated based on your subject field. So if we're talking about something like fitness, right? Fitness and biology or in environmental science uh, means something very different than what it means in nutrition, right? So uh, you will see those, uh, those changes reflected in topic pages as well. So the other thing that I, I want to point out as well um, are the links. So in terms of linking to content, when you see these reference numbers here, right, eight, nine, uh, those are referencing uh, the references at the bottom. When you click on that, um, you will see the information pop up here and then you see article. So when I click on article, that will actually open the article page for this specific article, right? Um, so that's how the linking happens. And then you can see on the right here, uh, recommended articles. This is again, based on what you're currently looking at as well as your previous interactions with ScienceDirect. So um, one thing that I, I want to point out as well is the journal pages. So if I click on Marine Policy, right, um, this is the Marine Policy Journal volume number 100 from February of 2019. When I click on that, I open up Marine Policy volume 100. So we can see the entire volume listed here. Um, you can download the full issue if you have access, which I believe NOAA does. Um, and then you get um, little drop down menus here at the top that talk about the articles and issues about the journal and then submit your article. So um, because we're just looking at one volume here, I can actually click on Marine Policy again. And when I do that, I get to the journal homepage. So you can see uh, what are the factor, uh, what are the metrics, right? Site score and then impact factor. You can view the editorial board as well as the current aims and scope of the journal. You can set up a journal alert. You can view either the latest issues or um, all of the issues if you would like. 
And then here on this side where it says find out more, right? You have submit your article, which typically opens the Elsevier uh, submission system. You'll find the guide for authors, uh, which is typically a downloadable PDF. And then when you click on about the journal, um, this is where you actually open up the Elsevier.com page for marine policy. Uh, it's got a lot of the same information, right? The site score, the impact factor, um, the guide for authors, recent articles, right? Same kind of thing. But one thing I like is this is where it includes all of the journal insights. So when you click on journal insights, you'll actually get some nice charts that show how these metrics have been changing over time. Are the numbers going up? Are they going down? Are they pretty steady? So. So that is all I have. Katie, are there any other questions that um, we should cover before we finish the webinar? Um, I don't think so. I do want to kind of mention to everyone that this is mainly coming from a NOAA central library perspective, and we serve um, Silver Spring for the most part. If you are located in a different part of the country um, and you have a library with you, like if you're in La Jolla, California, or if you're in Seattle, or if you're in Boulder, Colorado, you have a library and they are your main um, contact point and they are going to have a different uh, subscription basis than Central Library does. So if you are VPN into NOAA Central Silver Spring, you are going to get access to what we have. If you are VPN'd into Boulder, you're going to have what they have. If you are free floating and do not have a library, this is where it gets slightly tricky. NOAA Central is trying to collect all of your IPs and make sure that we can be your hub at that moment. Um, but we're still working through that. So if you are free floating, you don't have a library associated with you, you're in Montana, you're in Alaska, please let us know. So email library.reference at noaa.gov and we will try and figure out what type of access you can have. And I believe that is um, kind of it. I, I want to reiterate that you do have to be on VPN to sign in to, to create a science direct account. So if you are on your, you know, your workstation, you're on your laptop, desktop, whatever, and you VPN to your NOAA workstation into the NOAA network, then you want to go to science direct and you want to create an account when you're connected via VPN. Once you do that, it will connect your NOAA subscriptions, your NOAA, you know, NOAA NIS <laughs> with <laughs> Science Direct. So then you can get off VPN, you can use a different computer, you can travel anywhere. I mean, I hope you're all staying home and staying safe, but you can leave that desktop and just sign in and have the same access level. And if you already have an Elsevier account, Christian, Christina, sorry, um, they just have to contact you, correct? What, where should they contact? Can you show us the, the kind of yeah, email? Yeah, so if you, call? Um, if you just look for Science Direct Support Center, um, then we actually have, let's, let's make sure that it's running up again. Uh, we have a chat option, um, really great um, help like in the moment. So you just click on chat, it's like chatting on instant message um, and they can help you associate your account with NOAA. Um, or you can send them an email, it takes about five business days for them to respond, um, particularly because of the uh, current pandemic. Uh, so I would suggest chat if you would like immediate help, um, but this is where you can go, um, Science Direct Support Center. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I think that is everything. And we are right on time. Of course. Great. Thank you, Katie. And thanks to Noah for having me. Thank you, everyone. I hope you all have a wonderful and safe uh, rest of your day. Bye. Bye.